Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We would like to extend a very warm welcome to each one of you at the nice global conclave from the laps of the beautiful Himalayas, where the Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement is located. The think tank was established in the month of February in the year 2016. It undertakes independent research in the field of international relations, foreign policy, security studies, and development. NICE has four research centers, China Studies, Neighborhood Studies, Non-Traditional Security Studies, and Security and Strategic Studies. The last one. The institute focuses on eight research topics, climate change and energy, global governance, sustainable development and smart cities, refugee and migration, China's Belt and Road Initiative, border and transboundary water politics, Indo-Pacific affairs, disaster management, and international economy and development. Previously, NICE has had the opportunity to host distinguished speakers from all around the globe. It was a great pleasure inviting me to speak here at NICE. It's a real pleasure to be able to speak with all of you. Well, thank you anyway, and I certainly admire the work that you're doing. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all. NICE Global Conclave is the flagship event of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement. The theme of the three-day conference is connecting Nepal to the world by bringing leaders, diplomats, business leaders, and scholars from all around the globe. The objective of this conclave is to introduce Nepal to the world and at the same time update the Nepalese policymakers and experts about the fast-changing geopolitics, which will help Nepal to reshape its foreign policy to achieve its national goal. This is the eighth session of the conference, and the session that we're going to have is on gender in international relations. And to cheer and moderate this session, uh, it is a real pleasure to have Professor Anuradha Senoy here with us. Professor Senoy is the former Dean at School of International Studies, uh, GNU New Delhi. Uh, she has been the chairperson of the Area Studies and director of the Center for Russian and Central Asian Studies as well. She has several publications on security studies, uh, development studies, and gender studies. Uh, and to name a few, some of the articles she has written is on Maoist and other um, conflict, re-emerging Russia, uh, structural institutions and processes, the making of the new Russia, uh, competitive politics and crisis of governance, the Russian condom, militarism, and women in South Asia as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to request the chair to take over. Uh, thank you, Nice, and especially my student, uh, Pramod, uh, for uh, having this uh, session of gender and international uh, relations. Uh, I might tell our audience that um, in South Asia, uh, gender is still an add-on uh, in international relations, and international relations as a subject which I've taught for about 40 years, and um, studied it remains a highly realist, um, masculinist, patriarchal, uh, and hawkish uh, study. So uh, I think it's critical for us to get in our uh, point of view, and it's becoming more and more clear about how important it is. And for this, we have a most distinguished panel today. Uh, I'll introduce each one as we go along, but I would say that each one of them has is a classic uh, in international relations. Their work is considered a classic and will be for the next decades. Uh, the first speaker would be Professor Dr. Anne Tickner, who's Professor Emerita, University of Southern uh, California and distinguished scholar at the American University. 
Uh, she's done a lot of work now recently, of course, her uh, critique of realism is a classic, uh, but uh, the, the impact of feminist and gender approaches to IR and um, what kind of difference it's made to international politics. I believe today she's going to speak on gender and the state. Professor Tikna, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chinoy. Um, it's indeed a privilege to be speaking to you to all today. And I thank um, Dr. Pramod Jaiswal and all the organizers for putting on such an intellectually rich conference. It is a pleasure to be on a panel with Dr. Cynthia Enlow and Laura Schoberg. In the late 1980s, it was Dr. Enlow who got us started on this journey, bringing feminist perspectives to international politics. When she asked a seemingly simple question, where are the women? And Laura Schoberg was my first PhD student doing research from a feminist perspective. Both of these remarkable scholars have continued to challenge us to think differently about international politics. In this talk, I will focus on the academic discipline of international relations, or IR as it is called, by giving a brief introduction to the development of feminist IR. I will conclude by assessing its impact on international politics. Dr. Enloe's question, where are the women, turned out not to be so simple after all. It wasn't until the mid 1980s, well into my IR career, that I began to notice that there were few women in the field and almost no texts by women scholars that I could assign to my students. International politics was a man's world. There were few women heads of state, ministers of foreign affairs or defense or military leaders. While this is no longer the case with some states even declaring a feminist foreign policy, international politics is still predominantly a man's world. Trying to understand and explain why this is the case is what motivated me and other feminists to do the kind of work we do. Feminist perspectives on IR got started in the late 1980s in the context of a larger shift in the discipline. During the Cold War, US IR was heavily invested in strategic thinking and great power rivalry, thought best to be explained by realist theory. Realism became the dominant paradigms in other parts of the world too. After the Cold War, however, the discipline opened theories of which feminism was one. I will begin by defining gender because I think it is key to understanding both how feminists explain the persistent inequalities between women and men, and also how states behave in the international system. Feminists define gender as an analytical tool a set of variable but socially and culturally constructed characteristics. Those such as power, autonomy, rationality, and the capacity for leadership are stereotypically associated with masculinity. Sorry, my... Uh... I'm just having a little problem here with my uh, technical uh, issues. Um, okay, they're opposite weakness, relationality and emotion, as well as caregiving are associated with femininity. There is evidence to suggest that both women and men assign more positive value to masculine characteristics. To be successful in the public sphere, women frequently try to emulate men. 
It is important to stress that gender is not just about women or even about individuals. It is also about structural equality, inequalities that govern our lives. Since gender is a social construction, it is not amenable to causal theory, which is why most feminists prefer critical or constructivist theories. IR feminists frequently begin their research at the micro level, attempting to understand how individuals embedded in social relations related to gender, race, class, and geographical location both impact and are impacted by international politics. They have also investigated gendered states, analyzing the extent to which states and their leaders aspire to the masculine characteristics described in order to achieve success in an anarchical international system. Developing such research programs involves extending the boundaries of the discipline, asking different questions, and listening to unfamiliar voices. Unlike conventional IR, which strives for objectivity, feminists are explicit about the political commitments in their scholarship. With roots in social movement, Feminism's normative goal is to understand and transform unequal power relations between women and men. So what are the kinds of questions that feminists are asking? Deciding which questions are important is based on prior assumptions about how we define global politics. It is significant because it defines what counts as issues worth researching and theorizing about. It is often the case that the questions that IR feminists ask are considered irrelevant for explaining, quote, well, real world issues, or are judged as interesting but outside IR's disciplinary boundaries. And here I return to Dr. Enloe's question, where are the women? a question not typically asked by the IR discipline. Feminists have looked for women not only in the halls of state power, but also in social movements, in migration flows, in peace negotiations, and in terrorist organizations. Locating women in these diverse places involves placing them within gendered structures. Typically, feminist research questions are investigating how the international political system and the global economy contribute to the subordination of women. For example, women work longer hours, many of which are spent in unremunerated reproductive and caring tasks that are not counted when we measure productivity. To investigate such issues, feminists are rethinking the meaning of security beyond its focus on national security, which has been predominant in international relations. So how has feminist theory impacted the discipline? The volume and variety of feminist research is impressive. Many more women are present in the academy and at professional conferences, Students who have taken my courses have told me that it changes the way they think about the world. However, in the US, and I suspect and know that in other places as well, there is still enormous resistance to including feminist courses in core curricula. In certain respects, I think that the international policy world has been more receptive than the academy. Certain states, such as Sweden, Australia, Canada, and others, are making women's issues central to their foreign policy. In theory, at least, the commitment to gender mainstream is widespread, and gender issues are high on the international agendas. But that... Oh, sorry, I'm having some more problems.
That being said, there are still huge gaps in implementation and in understanding the meaning of gender. And if we were to significantly mitigate gender inequality, it would require deep structural changes that would be very threatening to existing power structures. Let me conclude with some observations about our current challenges. Could it be that COVID-19 is changing the way we think about leadership? Many of the states, South Korea, New Zealand, Iceland, and some of the Scandinavian countries that have performed well in fighting the pandemic are led by women. Caregiving, typically associated with women, has become a valuable tool for state leadership. Could it be that the pandemic has caused us to imagine a new kind of global leadership where care is as important as military strength and a world where men's and women's skills are equally valued in the conduct of international politics? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anne, for raising these most pertinent questions uh, as part of your conclusion. And now I'd ask Professor Laura Soberg, who is Professor at the School of International Relations, University of Florida, and she would speak on gender and security studies. Laura, over to you. Uh, thank you, and thank you for having me. It's always uh, tough to follow Anne because she's so good at both thinking about things and synthesizing them. And I feel like in hindsight uh, and in comparison, I babble a little bit, so I will try not to um, and kind of discuss the... So I want to talk a little bit about the role of gender in security, and it's something that I've been thinking of kind of over the long term uh, and so I guess I have a couple of insights that I think are general and then ones that I think are changing a bit. Um, so about 15 years ago, I wrote a piece that made the argument that there are three important ways to understand gender in security. Uh, now I think there's more than three. So I'm going to tell you about the first three, uh, and then I'm going to tell you about a few things that have changed since then. So I made the argument that gender is important in conceptualizing security, that it's important to understanding causes and predicting outcomes, and that it's a key part of any solution to a security problem. Um, so I'm going to talk about all three of those briefly um, to give you a sense of what I meant by them. So when I say it's important in conceptualizing security, I mean that when you think about gender, when you use a gender lens to think about security, you see different things than you might see if you neglected concepts of gender. Uh, so for example, uh, one of the things that I've thought a lot about is if you flip the question, what does it mean to be secure into the question, what does it mean to be insecure? Which of course in theory should be a direct opposite that actually evokes completely different imagery for most people who hear those two questions. Uh, it brings, what a lot of feminist scholars have done good work about, which is showing that there's a spectrum and a continuum of violence, not just uh, in the international arena, but around global politics more generally. So Chris Cuomo made the argument that war doesn't start and end, uh, that instead there's a continuum of violence among states and in the international arena. And there's also been a lot of work on if you look for where women are and where gender is, you see that there's not some big break between international violence and violence that isn't international, but instead there's kind of a spectrum that helps us understand security as both broader and deeper than some of the mainstream approaches to studying international relations might seem and also to the ways that it's used in the policy arena sometimes. Although, um, as Anne noted, there's a lot more kind of movement on these issues in the policy arena than there is sometimes in scholarly IR. So a broader and deeper understanding of what it means to be secure, and more importantly to me, what it means to be insecure. Um, the second thing that I wanted to say is that I think gender is key to understanding causes and predicting outcomes in 
the ways that security functions. Um, so the ways that, that I'm sure Cynthia will talk to you about militarism will demonstrate this uh, pretty strongly. Uh, but I think that there's a lot of uh, examples in gender scholarship and IR where you really can't understand what went wrong or what went right or how something happened in the security arena without understanding the ways that the gender dynamics happened. Um, so one of the kind of first books I read that taught me about this, and it's still one of the better books I've read that taught me about this, is Catherine Moon's Sex Among Allies, which explains that you can't understand the macro-political relationship between the United States and South Korea without understanding the role that individual camp town prostitutes' lives had on, in that relationship, and that you then also couldn't understand individual people's lives within this dynamic without understanding the macro political dynamics and that that all had an axis based on gender so you can't understand what's going on pretty frequently in security unless you ask yourself questions about women gender and sexuality so then the third part is that it's a key part of solving security problems so if something isn't working in the security sector and you want to make it work uh then i think that that's something that you need to ask questions about gender to do and there are two things uh that i want that i'd point out that i thought were really good at this in terms of explaining it one is laura shepherd's very detailed work over a very long time on the women peace and security agenda that talks to us and tells us why if you don't understand the gender dynamics of the constitution of not only international organizations, but also security, you want to understand why some things in the WPS agenda work and some of them don't, and how to make the ones that don't work work or understand why they couldn't. Another piece that was pretty useful for this is Megan McKenzie's work on disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration processes, where she talks about the ways in which gendered assumptions are made about former soldiers, and when those gendered assumptions are incorrect, they result in a dysfunctional DDR program that doesn't actually decrease the likelihood of returning to conflict. So those are kind of the three big things that I originally saw being important in gender and security. And then I'm gonna kind of close my discussion with a few more ideas that I would add to that now with a little bit more kind of hindsight and view in the field. Uh, the first is that uh, as feminists, we've always talked a lot about positionality in security uh, and particularly the ways that the way that you're where you are located uh, on a wide variety of axes around the world actually matters in terms of how you see and interact with security. I think that that took a long time to become, in my view, equated with a decolonial and intersectional approach to thinking about sex, gender, and race and global politics. But I now think that you can't ask questions about gender and positionality in global politics with also, without also asking how gender is raced and race is gendered. Um, so I think that thinking about gender and security is also a commitment to intersectional thinking about positionality and the ways that security and insecurity are not just gendered but raced. In addition to that, it's really important to talk not just about gender, but about sex and sexuality. Uh, so pretty often we talk about gender and we talk about the ways in which sexualities may be gendered. Um, but often the sexuality is a predicate uh, to thinking about uh, gender insecurity. But more recently, there's been a lot of work about the ways in which sex and sexuality themselves are constitutive of security situations and therefore need to be kind of thought of uh, in terms of their own contribution in addition to in terms of their view of gender. Uh, so right now I'm writing a book on uh, treaty marriage transfers of territory, which have a gendered story and a story about sexuality, but they also have a story about sex and sex acts. Um, and thinking about how that interacts in security is, I think, pretty important. Um, and then kind of the last point that 
that I'll kind of close on is that I think that the theory and practice worlds uh, we so often kind of think about now in academia as separate where you do research and then depending on your national context that research has impact and those two things can kind of get separated and thought about differently um, in different ways uh, but I think that one of the things that's really important is that when Anne's talking about the history of studying gender and international relations, one of the key things that made the field just so cool as it got started was that it was never in this ivory tower outside of thinking about impact. Um, and somehow, in some ways, it kind of got moved into that. And I think now it's moving back out a little bit. But I think that Marisha Zalowski one time characterized theory as practice itself, um, which I always thought was kind of a really good way of thinking. Yes, there are moral implications to everything I say and do, even if people never listen to it. And then above and beyond that, people do listen to it. Um, and there is a kind of back and forth between scholarly theorizing about gender insecurity and then what states do and what non-state actors do and what NGOs do. So thinking about how we study gender insecurity as related to how gender insecurity are associated or thought through in the policy world is really important. And at least for me and my work on women's political violence, there are times in my career when I kind of forgot government reads this. Scarier than that, militaries read it. And even scarier than that, intelligence reads it. Um, and when you forget that, then you can kind of detach your studying of the ephemeral nature of sex and gender from what happens to real people. But I think that at its core and at its strongest, the study of gender insecurity is the study of gender and real people's security. Um, and that's an everyday practice in addition to a theory. So I think that I've taken my time um, and will be quiet now. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, wonderful and appropriate uh, looking into gender and uh, security. And now we have uh, Professor Cynthia Enlow. Um, before I introduce her, I might say that she influenced me greatly uh, when I first um, read her book and uh, decided to write on uh, militarism and women in South Asia, which in turn apparently influenced a lot of young um, feminist writers, potentially, who were my students um, and who are now professors all over the world, uh, including Pramod, um, the organizer here. And also we have to think of the fact that in Nepal, in the Maoist movement, almost 30 to 40% of the cadre were women. And women are seeking their rights in every sphere in, in Nepal. So it's no wonder that uh, uh, Pramod has uh, chosen uh, this discussion and panel. So Professor Cynthia Enlo is research professor, Department of International Development and Women and Gender Studies and the Department of Political Science at Clark University. And she would speak on gender analyzing militarism. So Professor Enlo. Hi, Anu. It's a pleasure and an honor that you're um, here uh, chairing us. So you were very good to do that. I've met some of your former students, so I know your influence is far and wide. And it's a delight to be here with Anne and Laura. We are all co-conspirators in trying to shake up the way people think about international uh, politics. And um, we've got our work cut out for us, but now we've, there's a whole gang of us, if you will, globally, um, that are doing this work and the students um, are continuing to teach us, which is the best. You know you're alive if you still have things to learn, right? Um, let me start with um, just a quick comment, and I don't mean to embarrass, well, I do, of course. I was gonna say, I don't mean to embarrass, but I actually do mean to embarrass uh, the people, the wonderful people in NICE who put together this remarkable uh, conference, which is so impressive. But take a look at your own website and look at the image you put up for security. That was when you were listing what NICE's different topics of investigation and discussion are. And when you put up your 
image of your interest in security, what did you put up? You put up a jet fighter plane, a military plane. And here's the thing to be on the lookout for. Feminists, all kinds of feminists, we watch everything, don't we, Anu? We watch everything. And so we watch people's web pages. We watch what you casually think security looks like. And if you think security looks like a military um, assault weapon, um, we notice. So let me say something about militarism and why feminists who are interested in international politics um, have really taken on militarism in all its many forms. Um, first, we do it not only as gender specialists, we do it increasingly calling ourselves feminists. And why do we do that? One of the things I think we've all learned, and we'll all have different interpretations of this, and in the discussion, maybe some of you who are participants can ask us again what we mean by each of us when we say we're feminist, gender, and international relations specialists. Why do we say feminist? I think for me, I began saying feminist when I described my own approach to international politics analysis is because I'm interested in power. I'm interested in ideas. I'm interested in the ways that ideas and practices, assumptions, beliefs, I'm interested in the way they shape power, the uses of power, and people who are at the other end of power operations. That is, I say I'm a feminist, not just a gender analyst, because I'm interested in power. And whenever I watch gender at work in anything, as both Anne and uh, Laura described the array of things we're all interested in, including political economy, um, when we are interested, we never take our eyes off of power. That is what gives us a feminist approach to investigating the workings of gender and IR. And one of the things that I've learned over the years, both Anne and Laura and I are continuing to be learners. Um, one of the things that I've learned about myself over the years, I started out uh, studying ethnicity, race, and militaries um, way back when I had no feminist or not enough feminist uh, curiosity, but I was very interested in race and ethnicity in militaries, which is one of the reasons I studied the Pakistani, the Indian, the Indonesian, the Nepalese uh, militaries. Um, one of the things that I realized when I became more feminist in my investigations is that all those years, I'll whisper it because it's a big secret, all those years, I underestimated power. I underestimated what it took to recruit either an insurgent or a state military. I underestimated what it took to deploy either a state Navy. We were just listening in the session before about navies. We underestimated what it takes for states to wage war. We underestimated how much power uh, was at work, how much thinking was at work. So one of the first things that I learned about militarism is you cannot raise a state military and sustain a state military, and you cannot deploy the way state officials would like to deploy a state military, whether it's be for peacekeeping operations or for defense operations or for aggressive operations, you cannot deploy a state military unless you think about mothers. Well, feminists think about mothers. They think about how much effort every government's defense ministry puts into trying to control the emotions and the active support or not of women in their role as mothers. They think about it. Just a minute, let me just get this so it goes off. And that was a breakthrough for me to think that as a political scientist, I was trained at University of California at Berkeley in the 1960s um, when we all thought we were radical. Well, it turned out we weren't radical 
enough, we probably weren't radical at all. But anyway, we were certainly weren't radical enough because we thought you could understand militarism, war waging. You thought you could understand it without taking seriously how much governments expend power trying to control the emotions and the ideas and the actions of mothers. Well, that means that as a non-feminist student of militaries, this is back in the 1970s, I was underestimating power. Second thing we did, all of us, and a lot of us still do um, on this call, and that is we don't think about girlfriends and we don't think about wives. We think that a, mil that a state can simply deploy a military on a peacekeeping operation as the Nepalese military is deployed or on defensive operations or on aggressive operations. We think that any military can be deployed without government spending a lot behind the scenes so that the rest of us won't notice, that is we as citizens or we as people in neighboring countries, won't notice that the government is spending a lot of effort to exert pressure on the women married to the mostly male militaries. Militaries around the world are still overwhelmingly male, at least 85% in most countries, even more. Uh, that government spe officials spend a lot of time trying to pressure women as wives to go along with their husband's deployment, even though it's dangerous, maybe it's reckless, maybe it's futile, or maybe it's just dangerous. Um, and most of us who don't use a feminist curiosity, therefore underestimate government's workings of power because we don't watch the efforts to control wives. We don't watch the efforts to control girlfriends. We don't watch the efforts to control mothers. And a lot of you out there who haven't been trained in feminist um, analytical skills probably think, I, I don't know anything about mothers. Well, of course you have one, but I don't know anything about mothers. I don't know how to investigate mothers. And what Anne and Laura and all our growing number of analyst friends would say to you, okay, so learn. Learn how to think about women's relationships to militarization. Because one of the things we've learned is you cannot militarize a society, get its support for a over large defense budget, get support for the military having more and more authority in domestic affairs, get support for the military being deployed. You cannot do that unless you persuade a lot of women as well as men to think it's in their interest. And this brings to a second aspect here. And that is that when feminist gender analysts of international politics do their investigations, again, including of overseas migration for paid labor, for instance, Nepali men going to Doha to work as security guards in hotels, for instance. In all of those instances, what we investigate are not just where are the women and where are the men. We do. We always ask, where are the women? And as Laura warned us, intersectionally, we think about all kinds of men, women. If we think about Sri Lanka, we think about, does it matter if you're a Tamil woman or if you're a Sinhalese woman? We ask that. But we also ask about ideas. We watch the workings of ideas about, ideas, things that humans, we dream up. And we dream up a lot, by the way what we dream up about what is really manly and what is really the true woman. We watch that because we know that ideas about what is a real man and ideas about what is a real woman, those are all in quotes, real is always in quotes, that's our ideas. Um, we know that those play core roles in international politics as well as in domestic politics. Is it a real man to go overseas to work as a security guard in Doha because he becomes an income earner for the family and that's what masculinity is all about in a marriage. 
but it's also about wielding ideas about femininity and masculinity in international affairs for the sake of militarism. And we've watched it, we've charted it, we've documented it, and we continue to watch it. And that is that men often wield ideas about femininity. Watch the bouncing ball here, everybody. Men in positions of military and foreign and oftentimes treasury finance politics wield ideas about femininity to intimidate other men. Now you can only do this, that is a man can only try to embarrass or intimidate another man by calling him a girl or saying stop being like a woman, which does happen man to man. You can only use that as a weapon of intimidation if you don't respect femininity. That is that the use, the wielding of ideas about femininity can only be used as a verbal narrative weapon, which is a form of weaponry, narrative is. You can only do it if you are in a society that thinks that anything that is feminine is of lesser value of lesser merit, of lesser seriousness, of lesser rationality, of lesser toughness, as Anne said, than anything that's masculine. That's called patriarchy. So when I chart the, militariz the remilitarization of Myanmar, I do watch how young men have gotten recruited. I do watch their families. I do watch those men who reject it in Myanmar, thousands of them now. And they are standing up to or challenging ideas about what is a real man. A real man is a small d Democrat. Well, that's a quite a different notion that a real man is a, is a soldier. Um, so I'd like to stop at this point, but just say that the kinds of things we watch are where are real women in all their diversity? Where are real men, actual men, sorry, not real, forget about real, that's too loaded. Actual women in all their diversity, where are actual men in all their diversity and all the gender fluid people in between? Where are they? Watch them and then watch ideas about masculinity and ideas about femininity and you'll have your plate full. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Professor Enlo. And we do have some time for uh, questions and I can see one question in the chat box, though I can't see any question box, uh, which asks um, all three uh, that uh, what uh, can a country like Nepal, which is still fighting against basic feminist issues and security concerns for women, what can, uh, what approaches would you recommend uh, for uh, this small non-Western country of understanding, I guess, uh, security and feminism? I think the lectures were all about that, but nonetheless, this is a question in the chat box. I'll just join in to say really quickly, um, I've learned from Sarah Tamang and other uh, uh, Nepalese uh, feminists, and I would say, listen to Nepalese feminists. Don't listen to us. Listen to Nepalese feminists. There are a lot of them, right, Anu? There are a lot of them. Listen to them. Pay attention. Take exactly, them yeah. Including um, in, the, in your Supreme Court. Uh, so uh, the other question is, uh, apart from Finland and New Zealand, which countries do you think have got the link between feminism and IR right? And uh, what can be the contribution of men in feminist international relations in terms of changing the way we traditionally view security? So this is to, yeah, again, to any uh, one in the panel. So uh, Anne, would you like to come in here and then Laura, and then I'll give the floor back to Cynthia. Anne? Okay, um, could you repeat the question? Um, well, they're actually asking one about Nepal specific, about what kind of approach uh, Nepalese uh, young women can take towards security. 
Uh, second, uh, it's about uh, um, they, they, women are still fighting for very basic feminist issues uh, in uh, many of the third world countries. So uh, how would you, uh, what would you advocate for them? And uh, which countries do you think have got the right link between feminism and IR besides Finland and New Zealand? These were the three questions I can see in the chat box. Well, um, I think what Cynthia said is uh, really the answer to this first part of this question. Um, there are so many wonderful feminists in Nepal and other countries in the global south. Uh, listen to them, don't listen to us. I mean, have wonderful ideas, wonderful ideas about um, about conflict. I mean, there's a very lively group of African women who uh, work on conflict resolution. Um, listen to yourselves, you're doing great work. And uh, we also need to listen to you more than we have in the past. Um, who gets it right? I I don't know all the countries who who get it right. Um, I do think there is movement, as I said, in the international system as a whole to uh, understand um, gender issues. Uh, Laura raised the uh, women, peace, and security agenda, which has really uh, taken off at least. Uh, uh, but, uh, I, I, it's taken off uh, sort of verbally, but I think that it has a long way to go uh, with implementation. And um, But it's moving really much faster than I, I expected when I started doing this. Moving in the policy world, as I say, much more than the academy. So we, we just need to listen to people out there in the policy world, in social movements, et cetera. Um, I'm always very disheartened by uh, the Academy's lack of uh, listening to these ideas and teaching these ideas because I get uh, ex-students who say to me, I, I went to work for an organization that wants me, me to know something about gender and uh, I never learned anything uh, in my university career. And I, I think that this is very bad, but it, it's all a question of local people who are so um, able to do this, uh, thinking for themselves, not us people telling them what to do. Okay, so there are a couple of other questions which I'll now address to Laura. And one of them mm. is that, uh, do you think mm. that um, in countries like India, and I think it's global also, uh, terming issues like international development and other issues which are important as soft issues and soft power, is that essentially a masculinist way of looking at foreign policy? This is one question. I think it's an interesting question. Then how do you create a consolidated transnational movement for demilitarization? And there is this young woman, Kushi Singh, who has her hand up. Um, do you want to ask a question, Kushi, or do you want to put it in the chat box? Yes, Kushi. You have to unmute. Kushi, you'll have to unmute. And no one can unmute. Let me try her. Huh? Oh, no like one can unmute. Everyone. Yes, yeah, Kushi, I, go ahead. We can yeah, unmute. Yeah, I am unmuted now. Uh, Thank you, everyone. It was a brilliant discussion, and all four of you, your work has been so inspirational. And uh, hi, Cynthia, happy to see you again. Uh, so, for a few points that I just wanted to make was because we are talking about um, gender and IR in the you know, and it's a, it's a South Asian conclave which is happening. I think it's very important that we do not uh, forget the ground realities, the social realities of the region that we are talking about. Because while we talk about racialized uh, security and you know masculinity, we don't say anything about caste. And I say this as a feminist born with caste privilege. I think it's very important going ahead as feminist IR scholars from the Global South, from South Asia, that we take these internal systems of oppression um, and, and very, very brutal oppression into account as we are expanding our understanding of foreign policy. Because I think what happens otherwise is that, you know, there's 
foreign policy and then there's gender and um, nice has done a brilliant job here but you know i was just seeing the program and and, and and i actually just like did a quick search and the program has gender mentioned seven times women one security 30 times and foreign policy 14 times and feminism doesn't even make it to the program and i think this is very, very, very crucial because we can't be the sprinkling all the time. It's, it's essential. Um, and another thing that I just, uh, because we're talking about feminist foreign policy and, and this is something where I, I work on women diplomats of India, early women diplomats of India and intellectual thought of Indian uh, envoys. Uh, and one thing that my work is also moving towards is when we talk about feminist foreign policy, we come from a region which uh, which fought back colonialism. We can find the traces of that feminist thought in the struggle for freedom. So, you know, so, so at least for me, I, I, I'm really fed up of saying, you know, let's have feminist foreign policy and not talk about feminist governance. I don't want a, I don't want a slice of the pie. I want the entire cake. And that, that vision, that feminist vision is in our own histories. Uh, and our domestic histories, uh, where again, caste uh, becomes very important because caste, uh, anti caste movements, tribal movements, Adivasi movements, we have to look at these movements because that feminist thought is in there. Um, I think that's, that's how we, yeah, we'll have to, we're, we're kind of closing in with time. So I want to give the floor now to Laura to uh, address those earlier two questions on the whole issue of soft power, um, which of course came from uh, American uh, scholars and it's now trickled down very strongly everywhere uh, about soft power and hard power, etc. So your take on that, Laura. So I once got an invitation to a conference held at Harvard on soft power where there were no women and no people who weren't white supposed to talk about soft power. Um, yeah. So I've gotten a little better. The last one I got had like one person who wasn't white and three women. So, you know, like baby steps or something like that. Um, you know, to me, I think that there is an inherent sexuality in the discourses of hard power and soft power that like people make a funny joke about, but then just kind of let go. And I think that that's crucially important in thinking, sorry about that. Uh, that's crucially important in thinking about the ways in which we frame these issues. Because it's not a question of, is it inherently masculinist, which to me is not a dichotomy, it's a spectrum, right? It's instead a question of, what are the assumptions that you have to make in order to be able to talk this way? And I think one of the assumptions that you have to make in order to be able to talk about the status soft power discourse is, that there is this legitimate distinction between the hard and the soft. I really thought this would end soon, uh, but I'm kind of in somewhat urban London, so you're going to hear a little bit of it for a minute, I guess. Um, so I think that that kind of is something where it's important to note the legacy of it, both in gender and sexual terms. And in response to the question of who's getting it right, I think that I'll have a controversial answer, but there's part of the reason I get to be in the ivory tower, no one. And no one's even coming close, right? Like some people are doing some things that are beneficial and useful, but honestly, like even some of the best state feminist policies are still full of troublesome race implications, class implications, and nationalisms. Sometimes feminist policy is weaponized, like we treat our women better, so now we can treat the other state that doesn't. Um, so I think that, like, to me, instead of asking a question about what's ideal or who's doing best, I like to look at the specific context that I'm studying and say, all right, what are the problems with this and what are the lessons we can learn from it? And to me, that's a little bit, that works a little better in terms of analyzing piecemeal and being able to make a policy contribution. Okay, thank you for that. Um, I don't know how much more time we have, Pramod. You can just shut us off because still there are questions. And uh, I'd like to give a minute to each of the panelists as we conclude. There's one question, which I think actually goes to Dr. Enlo, but she already addressed it in her talk in which the person who's asking the question says that it's often women who take the front row in pushing men to be 
uh, in times of war and you know the usual thing that women are also uh, militarists. So, um, Dr. Enlo, that's for you. Yes, don't, dear participant, that's a really good caveat that women, if they're militarized, can think that their son will be make them proud as a mother if they join the state's military. That is true. That is one of the ways to militarize motherhood for the sake of state militarized power. That is making a mother feel proud, more proud that her son is becoming a um, soldier than if that same son decided that they wanted to be a social worker, which might actually make the whole social fabric stronger that is being a social worker, good social worker, uh, not a racist social worker, um, than if they became a soldier. But here was the double side of, of my finding and finding from being tutored by everybody. And that is that government officials, let's not just say states, because these are real officials. Government officials have to work really hard to persuade women as mothers women as girlfriends, women as daughters, women as sisters, women as wives. That is that women don't automatically become militarized to serve the state's interests. What I've found is that governments, in fact, trip all over themselves, make terrible mistakes, and in fact, alienate a lot of women in their efforts to try and militarize women. So it's not just that women can be militarized. Absolutely, they can be militarized. We have documentation in every country that's on this call, and certainly including my own, um, of women being militarized. But the other side of that realization is that a lot of women resist being militarized in any role they're playing in life, and governments have to keep trying to pressure them to be militarized. There's nothing automatic about either a man or a woman, a boy or a girl, being militarized. Okay, so uh, that was excellent. And uh, if uh, any of the panelists want to say the last, have the last word. I just had my last, and so then move on to Anne. <laughs> well, I just want to thank everybody for coming and all the good work you're doing in your own countries. As I said before, that's what counts. Uh, you don't have to listen to us. You have to listen to people around you and uh, and just keep up the good fight. It's it's an effort, I know. Panels like this also always make us feel good that these things are going to work in the real world, but um, it, it's a struggle and we have to keep struggling. But I do think we're making progress and I'm very heartened by that. And it's wonderful to uh, hear from so many voices in different parts of the world who are now engaging in this same struggle. So I'd just like to say good luck to everybody who's working on uh, feminism and gender and just try to keep going. We'll get there in the end, I think. Laura, any last few words? I think just thanking you all for this conversation. I tried to answer some stuff in the chat, um, but you can always also drop me an email or anything like that if you want to continue the conversation. I like to have these conversations, and I think that there's a lot of contingency and complexity in them. So I'm happy to continue them. So then, thank you. It's up to me now to thank the organizers, to thank our wonderful panelists. It's been an amazing experience. And of course, this will be available on YouTube, so young students can see it again and again. And be in touch with everyone. Thank you, uh, Nice, and thank you, uh, Cynthia and, and Laura. Thank you very, very much. And then we go back to the have come to the end of this session, we would like to express a sincere gratitude and thanks to the chair for agreeing to chair and moderate the session today. 
Our sincere thanks also goes to all the speakers for being a part of the event and delivering such comprehensive and convincing presentations. We would like to acknowledge our gratitude to our friends from the diplomatic community, experts, academia, media, and different organizations. Finally, we must also mention our deep sense of appreciation for the audience who participated in the webinar and those who are watching mm. us live. Thank you for your valuable time mm. and attention mm. and Valuable for making language. this session yeah. productive with mm -hmm. your questions. Fine. Once again, we are truly honored to have you all with us today. Please do join us in the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Let's give a big round of applause to all our speakers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Professor Tickner, Professor Eloy, you know, ma'am. Professor Laura, thank you so much for your time. Please unmute what I asked. It's all muted. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Hope to see you tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Nepal time.